Now we're going to be discussing the interactions between solutes and solvents. Now for those of you who have ever tried to mix oil and water, let's say vegetable oil, you'll notice that they don't mix. Similarly, if you were to take gasoline and mix it not with water, but instead with, say, benzene, which is C6H6 plus gas, you would notice that the gas would dissolve just fine and they would be mixed perfectly in solution. And the general rule for this is that like things will tend to mix with things that are like them. Now, for instance, this oil is nonpolar covalent, unlike the water, which is very polar. So in this instance, they don't mix. However, salt, NaCl, is ionic, which is very close to being very polar. They're approximately the same. So salt will dissolve just fine in there. However, it would have a harder time dissolving into benzene. Now we're going to be looking at how ionic uh, compounds interact with water in aqueous solutions. And the simplest and most familiar of which of these aqueous solutions is probably salt water, simple NaCl and H2O. Now if we blow up this picture, you'll notice that in the solution there are some sodium ions, some chlorine ions, or vice versa, and there's water. Now what will tend to happen is because these ions are charged, for example, we have uh, negative chlorine and the positive sodium is that because water is polar it will tend to put its uh, ends that are attracted to it, its charged ends towards each uh, ion. For example with the chlorine the more positive hydrogen ends will tend to be attracted to the chlorine and you can imagine it's surrounding this whole chlorine with a few molecules of oxygen or water rather like this. Similarly the sodium will attract the negative end which has the oxygen on it and you can again expect to find the sodium ions surrounded completely by a sort of shield of water and these attractive forces are strong enough to take the ions away from some sort of crystal of salt, like just say table salt, eventually dissolving it to a point where all of the parts are in solution and there's no longer a solid crystal of salt. Now some of these compounds surrounded by water, not particularly salt and chlorine ions, but for example uh, copper sulfate can often form uh, what are known as hydrates. And hydrates are simply crystalline structures like what we have over here, but it's an ionic compound surrounded by water. So for example, the copper sulfate forms a hydrate that has the formula CuSO4, that is you name the ionic compound, and then you put this symbol and list the number of water molecules that it's attached to. And then if you were to take this hydrate here and put it back into solution, these would again dissolve into their constituent ions because these water molecules would be able to break off and join the uh, water molecules in solution. Now we're going to be looking at very quickly uh, liquid solutes and solvents. Now I had this drawn earlier where uh, you can put oil on top of water without the two mixing and this is because of the differences in their structures. Oil forms nonpolar compounds, that is there's no charge across the molecule, whereas water has the positive charges where the hydrogen is and the negative charge at the oxygen end. 
Now these two don't mix because if you were to get some oil in here, what would end up happening is the charges on the oxygen atoms would sort of form a ring around oil, creating sort of bubbles through which the oxygen would not want to penetrate because it would be attracted to the positive and negative charges out here. And because these two don't mix, they are known as what are immixable or immiscable uh, liquids. That is, they're not soluble in one another. Likewise, if they were soluble, for example, uh, gas or oil in gasoline, that combination is what is known as a miscible liquid. Moving on now, we're going to be discussing the effects of pressure on solubility. Now, for the most part, when you're mixing two liquids or, you know, a solid and a liquid or anything like that, pressure really has no effect because the liquids are essentially incompressible. However, when you're mixing, let's say, a gas and a liquid, uh, pressure is a very important part of solubility because uh, gas molecules when above a liquid oftentimes will gain enough energy to penetrate the liquid surface and come down and chill in here in the liquid. In this instance it's a poorly drawn soda. But as you increase the pressure what ends up happening is that these molecules uh, get more tightly packed together and will more often collide with the surface, thus forcing them down into the solution more often. Now, a lot of these molecules have enough energy to then rise up and escape the liquid and rejoin the gas phase. However, the increase in pressure has a net effect where these molecules that make it back up are then quickly pushed back down. So while there's still gas at this pressure above the liquid, there's going to be more and more gas within the liquid solution at a higher pressure. So in general, this uh, gas liquid solution will reach some sort of equilibrium at which there is more gas within the liquid than there was before. Now the most formal representation of this relationship between pressure and solubility is what is known as Henry's Law. Now Henry's Law states that a gas's partial pressure, in this case we have CO2 above some sort of flavored soda as you would do at a uh, factory where they package it, it basically states that a gas's partial pressure is proportional to its solubility. That means that as the pressure goes up the solubility of the liquid, or the gas rather, sorry, will go up an equal amount. And this is why when they package uh, sodas at whatever factory they're doing it at, they do it at a pressure of 5 to 10 atm. So this way, because they have this higher pressure, they can also get more solubility of the CO2 within the soda. However, when you open up the soda, and the pressure is only one atmosphere, what ends up happening is the soda will rapidly release its CO2 in bubbles, as I'm sure you've experienced before, perhaps pleasantly, perhaps not. And this rapid release due to a lower pressure is a property known as effervescence. And effervescence is this reason behind CO2 bubbles forming when you crack open the cap or the tab on your soda bottle. Finally, we're going to be discussing the impact of temperature on solubility. Now, for gas in liquid solutions like the soda we have over here, you'll remember that there are particles of gas intermixed with the liquid and as you increase the temperature of the whole system, what ends up happening is that many more of these gas molecules start getting sufficient energy to leave the liquid phase and rejoin their gaseous buddies 
up here. So if you were to plot solubility, that is how many gas molecules per unit volume are within the actual soda, let's say, versus the temperature, you would find that as you increase the temperature, going this way, you would get less and less soluble because more gas molecules now have the ability to escape the liquid phase and rejoin the gaseous phase up here. Oppositely, if you were to have a solid dissolved in a liquid and you were to heat it up using some poorly drawn fire and increase the temperature of the whole solution, the water molecules would have enough energy to chip away more and more at this uh, potassium nitrate crystal and would also have the ability to expand a bit further even though they're slightly uh, incompressible and make sort of more room for this KNO3 within the solution. Now the impact of this temperature change really depends on the solid. So for example if you were to graph the solubility of this potassium nitrate versus the increase in temperature, you'd find that it goes up drastically as you increase the temperature. However, if you were to do, you know, salt, you'd find that salt almost flatlines with respect to temperature. The increase in temperature doesn't result in much change in its solubility at all. So it really depends on the solid. However, for the most part, many solids will increase in solubility as the temperature rises. The final thing we're going to be discussing in this video are what are known as enthalpies of solution. Now much like enthalpies of vaporization or enthalpies of fusion, enthalpies of solution uh, have something to do with a change in energy. More specifically it is measured as the energy absorbed when a solution is created. That is, it is the energy absorbed when a solute dissolves into a solvent. So, for example, if we have some sort of crystal structure down here in, let's say, this is water, uh, what happens is that both the water, which is connected by hydrogen bonds, and this crystal structure, which is connected by some sort of uh, intermolecular force, both of them are in a pretty low energy state right now. So in order for the water to break off a chunk and separate it, it has to overcome this intermolecular force, and that requires energy. So first, you're putting energy in. Next, it takes energy for the water to surround this particle and bond to it. So that requires energy as well. However, uh, once the crystal particle has been what is known as solvated, that is when it is surrounded uh, by, in this case, water, then a certain amount of energy is released and it is the combination of these three changes of energy that results in the net enthalpy of solution, whatever it may be. So for example, uh, potassium iodide, when dissolved in water, has a net enthalpy of 20.33 kilojoules per mole. And you'll notice that the units we use are similar to the molar enthalpies of vaporization and fusion. However, if for example you were to put sodium hydroxide into a solution of water, you would get a negative enthalpy of solution. That is negative 44.51. And this is because they release energy rather than absorb it when they are combined. And this is because in their separate states they had a higher potential energy than when they are combined. So when they're combined they release that extra potential energy as heat to the environment. And you'd be able to notice this, for example, if you were to dissolve potassium iodide in water and feel the container, 
it would feel cold because it's absorbing 20.33 kilojoules per mole from your hand as heat. Oppositely, if you were to feel the solution of sodium hydroxide, it would feel warm to the touch because it's releasing this amount of energy into the environment, which in this case would be your hand, you know, next to the beaker.